Okay, Katie, thank you so much. Uh, we pivot now to another one of the biggest areas of our focus over the past couple of years, uh, which is maximizing the impact of Biden era investments on your communities. Um, to lead that conversation and introduce our next segment, I'm thrilled to welcome a New Deal alum an innovative former mayor and county supervisor from Santa Cruz, California, and most importantly, the founder and co-host of our podcast and honorable profession, uh, Ryan Coonerty. Welcome, Ryan. Hey. Thank you. It's nice to see so many familiar faces. I am going to make a shameless plug that an honorable profession is really growing leaps and bounds. We're hearing from folks in the White House who are using it to track what's going on in the states and localities. Most importantly, we're here hearing from regular people who are using it as inspiration to run for office or help candidates run for office. So please make sure you're following it, spreading the word, coming on as a guest if we haven't, on you on, haven't had you on already or if you want to come back. Um, it's a great opportunity. It is my pleasure now to introduce you to, uh, I think, one of the most dynamic mayors uh, in the country, Mayor Justin Bibb. He's the 58th mayor of Cleveland. Uh, he uh, is following the Daniel Burnham quote to make no small plans. Uh, he is using federal dollars in a bunch of different sectors and we're really excited to hear about um, those efforts today and we're proud to have him as part, obviously as part of the New Deal um, and joining us here today. So, Mayor Bibb. Yes. Let's talk about a few of those plans. Yeah. Can you outline two or three that you're most excited about? Well, first, I wanted to thank Mayor Gallego for the invitation to our great city. It's been a lot of good sunshine in Phoenix, so let's give her a round of applause if we can. She's also uh, my colleague as uh, one of the vice chairs of Climate Mayors, as well as Lauren McLean, who's here as well, too. So we got, we got a lot of good mayors in the New Deal Club. Um, when I took office, uh, Cleveland was ranked the poorest big city in the country. Uh, nearly half of our children were living in poverty, and we were also ranked the worst city in the country for black women. Uh, but we are using uh, those challenges uh, to make some bold, big investments in our city because of the great work that the Biden-Harris administration has done in investing in cities uh, like Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, we received the eighth largest allocation of American Rescue Plan funds from the ARPA investments uh, over $512 million. And we wanted to make sure that those investments had these three criteria. Number one, can we leverage these investments over time, right? Secondly, equity, equity, equity. Everything we do as mayors must be rooted in racial equity and centering our public policies and the lived experiences of our residents. And thirdly, we want to ensure uh, that these investments would have a long-term transformational impact on our city. So one of the big things I'm excited about is our largest allocation of ARPA funding created a new $50 million sites fund for good jobs. So what are we doing? We are taking 1,000 acres of brownfield vacant land in our city that's predominantly located in black and brown neighborhoods in Cleveland and turning those 1,000 acres of brownfield vacant lots into shovel-ready greenfield sites. And why is that important? Well, Cleveland was once a walk-to-work city. Whether you walk to the old steel mill or the old manufacturing uh, base, and over the last two decades, we have lost nearly 20% of our population and have lost hundreds of thousands of jobs. And already, uh, this new investment is projected to create up to 65,000 new indirect and direct jobs in the urban core of our city. The other thing we're excited about is the work we're doing to address and eradicate lead paint in our community. Uh, no child should be, ever be poisoned uh, by lead paint in this country. And Cleveland has one of the biggest challenges in the nation when it comes to lead paint. And so we use $17 million of ARPA funds to create a fully funded endowment to work with the nonprofit community to ensure we can eradicate every home in our city around the lead paint crisis. And so those are the two of the, the biggest investments we've made around ARPA that I'm really excited about. One of the things I was interested in is you came from a background in education and technology. Um, how are you gonna leverage the massive changes we're looking at in technology to bring benefits to your city? Well, um, 
when I ran for mayor in 2021 um, as a first time candidate for public office, uh, when I was knocking on doors, uh, trying to get my name on the ballot, uh, the biggest thing voters told me was they wanted a modern and responsive city hall. And when I got to the mayor's office, um, it took me almost two days to get my email account set up. That's how far behind we were uh, when I took office in January of 2022. Uh, and in just two years, we've done a couple things to really change that. One, um, we have now created the first new city website we've had in nearly two decades in Cleveland. We can clap for that, that's a big deal. Um, we've also, will be launching a brand new 311 call center um, action hotline later this year because I made a commitment and a vow to my residents that they should be able to track a complaint like they track a FedEx or an Amazon package. And just two weeks ago, uh, we joined 85 other cities across the country to finally have an open data portal as well too because many of my lawyers in my law department are spending many hours on public records requests, on various data requests, and not getting contracts done, doing the people's work. So all those investments go a long way to make us a more modern and responsive uh, city government for the 21st century. Uh, as you mentioned, you made these big investments and big bets with ARPA funds. Um, we all know that those funds, unfortunately, are likely to be one-time funds. Uh, so how do you think about continuing to invest in this change and invest in communities uh, going forward? Yeah, well, beyond just uh, the ARPA funds, um, you know, from the Inflation Reduction Act to the CHIPS bill uh, to the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, all of those federal investments are giving cities like Cleveland and Boise and Phoenix and Detroit and Pittsburgh a once-in-a-generation opportunity to really center income um, equality, closing the racial wealth gap, and creating new opportunities for economic opportunity. And so we've really been focused on engaging our foundations and the private sector to compete for more than our fair share from the federal government. The other thing I would also say is it's so important uh, that we also prioritize uh, state support as well. Uh, right now, we are trying to become a two waterfront city in Cleveland because we sit on 20% of the world's fresh water in Lake Erie. We also sit on the banks of the Cuyahoga River, which uh, over 50 years ago caught on fire and is now a leading example of what clean waterways should look like in the country. And so we've been working with our federal delegation, uh, with leaders in the Biden-Harris administration, with the governor and members of the legislature to make a once in a generation investment in all waterfronts. And I believe it's that kind of public, public and private sector partnership we need to maximize uh, these federal and state investments as well, too. Talk about your interest in resilience, both through the climate mayors, but also through these clean water acts, cleaning uh, brownfields. How, how do you think about resilience and climate uh, for your city? Well, um, when I ran for mayor in 2021, I had no idea I would become a climate mayor. Um, and I say that because for a lot of folks in the climate change space, um, we've done, I think, a disservice in many ways to our residents by not grounding this conversation about addressing climate change in ways that everyday people understand. And um, one of the things I quickly uncovered was talking to a resident in the east side of Cleveland when I was knocking on doors. She talked about the fact that her son had asthma and it was in a part of the city that had one of the lowest tree canopies in our community, which affected the air quality. And two zip codes down the block, they had some of the best rates of air quality and low asthma. That's when the connection was made for me. And so when I talk about resilience, when I talk about climate and environmental justice, you know, we as mayors and as elected officials need to ground that conversation in safe communities, healthy communities, good jobs. Um, we think about, I think about at least, violence as an issue of climate and environmental justice because if you're living in a, in a heat island 
with no tree canopy or you live in a part of your community where it's not a good park to go to to relieve stress or to meditate or to play pickup basketball, then that's an environmental justice issue and has a direct impact on violence in most cities. And so all these things are interconnected and we as mayors and elected officials must do a better job of communicating that resilience in ways that everyday people can understand. I'm curious, you came as an outsider. I think I saw something you had like 2% name recognition. Less than that. <laughs> Less than 2%. There's only a couple numbers yeah, below that. Exactly. Uh, so um, <laughs> talk, can you talk about what surprised you about the job, about local government politics? Yeah. Um, I think the biggest surprise for me has been as a mayor, how many issues come across your desk, whether it's losing uh, another member of our city to gun violence or trying to find a way to get a deal done to create new development in a historically underserved neighborhood to now having to really serve as a champion for a woman's right to choose when Ohio tried to undermine our ability to protect choice. All these things are now on the front desk of mayors in a way they weren't pre-pandemic. And so I think the job, the role of the mayor has changed in a way that um, most of us probably didn't anticipate. But I think being a mayor of a city uh, is one of the most important positions right now in the country, given so much uh, gridlock and lack of trust we see in what's happening in Washington, D.C. Um, we are quickly becoming a nation of city-states uh, where mayors are leading the way on innovation. And as I've said before in, in many forums across the country, mayors are on the front lines to every issue we're facing in America, but we're also closest to the solution as well too, and I think it's that innovation our country needs uh, now more than ever. As you mentioned, your state uh, has become increasingly reactionary and red. There was a time when we all grew up and we all just waited for how Ohio voted and how they voted elected the president. Uh, how, what's your relationship with the state? What are you seeing on the ground as we go into 2024? And what do you see for the future of Ohio? Well, I'll never forget uh, one of my first meetings with the legislature when I was talking to a Republican member of the legislature in Ohio. And he said to me, Mayor Bibb, if you ran uh, your city like we run our rural townships, you'd be a lot better off. So in Ohio, it's not a Democrat or Republican issue. It's an urban versus rural divide. And I have to spend a lot of my time as a mayor educating and exposing extreme right-wing MAGA Republicans who've really undermined, I think, Ohio's potential. But in my heart of hearts, I still think Ohio is a purple state. I really do. Uh, President Obama won it twice. Uh, we're working very hard to reelect Senator Sherrod Brown, who's a Cleveland resident, by the way. Um, and I think we have a unique opportunity in Ohio to really show what can happen when Democrats and Republicans work together. I'll give you a couple of examples. One, um, in my first year in office, uh, I tried to expunge low-level marijuana convictions for Cleveland residents. And the reason why I tried to do this is because so many of my friends I grew up with um, had these low-level convictions on their records, and because they couldn't get them expunged, they couldn't get a home loan, couldn't get a small business loan, couldn't qualify for financial aid. And the courts tried to block us. But then I got a phone call from a Republican state senator, Nathan Manning. I knew his wife because she was my uh, spin class instructor. <laughs> and he said, Mayor Bibb, I love what you're trying to do to advance criminal justice in Cleveland. How about I add this in a statewide bill to give cities and counties the authority to expunge low-level marijuana convictions? Luckily, it passed the legislature, and Governor De uh, DeWine signed the bill. So it's one, one of many other examples where 
we have Democratic mayors finding common ground with Republicans in their legislatures and in governor's mansions. And I think we as mayors have to elevate that work now more than ever to really address all the social division and lack of common sense bipartisan governing we're seeing across the country. Finally, I want to ask you something because I, I know you're getting pulled in a million different directions, locally, nationally, for all the leaders in the room who are in the same boat. How do you think about how you prioritize your limited time, your limited energy? How do you find time for that spin class that then plays <laughs> dividends and statewide policy? Uh, so, uh, you know, like, how, how do you prioritize and, and get results? Well, I learned very early in my first six months that you can't wing something like that. You got to have a structure around it. Because, uh, you know, I was in a hurry to get everything done in my first year in office. I mean, I ran on the campaign slogan, Cleveland can't wait, uh, because I just knew how boldly we needed to change our city. But in my first year, my chief of staff sat me down and said, Mayor, once you're long dead and gone, I'm like, way to be morbid, man. It's kind of tough. What do you want to be remembered for? What are going to be your gravestone priorities? And we had about 10 priorities on the whiteboard, and we narrowed them down to three. So the first is uh, working to make Cleveland one of the safest big cities in America. The second is restoring the black middle class in Cleveland's uh, southeast side. And the last one was finally making Cleveland a two waterfront city that can be globally competitive. And so every day when I go to City Hall, there's th more than three people in my cabinet all working to execute those three gravestone priorities. And um, obviously, you know, crises come up, but every day someone's working on executing those three big things. And that's been uh, my North Star since uh, we took office two years ago. Well, I know I speak for all of us when I say we can't wait to see the results. We're so glad to have you in the New Deal, and uh, we uh, we need to get you on the podcast. Uh, but uh, but thank you for joining us today, and thank you for sharing your vision. Thank you, and thank you, thank you. And for any basketball fans, open invitation to see the Cavs playoffs. Just let me know. Thanks so much.